So we could go and compute the derivative of the inverse hyperbolic trig function. Uh, or I could just write it down. So I'm going to choose to just write these down because I don't want to spend the time computing them all. We have all we have the inverse derivative form and we have all the forward derivatives. So you just it's a really almost the same process. The only tricky part is uh, simplifying at the end is a little bit funky. So I'm just going to go ahead and write out all of these. So this is one over square root one plus x squared, and I'll rewrite cos hyperbolic. So there's all six inverse hyperbolic trig derivatives. And now we'll write down the six hyperbolic trig antiderivatives we get from the inverse hyperbolic trig derivatives. Two of these are very similar. And it should be pretty clear. It's the tangent, hyperbolic tangent inverse and hyperbolic cotangent inverse. They have a similar uh, derivative. In fact, the exact same derivative. So I don't need to make two antiderivatives right here because they're going to work on the exact same form. So I'm only going to use one of these two. And we'll just go for tangent instead of hyperbolic. So we'll start at the top, sine h inverse, and write down our free antiderivative that we get. So we're going to move the derivative to the other side as an antiderivative. So it's the inverse operator. So we're going to get integral and we're using u's du over square root 1 plus u squared equals. And we're going to, at the same time, instead of use 1, we're going to go with the constant a squared. And that lets us do a little less algebra uh, when we find these antiderivatives. We'll do examples with these as well. So this is going to be sine h inverse u over a plus c. Next up, integral du over square root u squared minus a, squ a squared. <coughs> Equals cosh inverse u over a plus c. And next one, we're going to do just the tangent inverse. Integral du over a squared minus x squared equals, and this one gets a 1 over a, tan inverse, hyperbolic tan inverse, u over a plus c. And our, let's see, we did secant next. We're going to move the negative to the other side. So this is du over u square root 1 uh, a squared minus u squared equals negative 1 over a seek hyperbolic inverse u over a plus c. And last, u over u square root a squared plus u squared equals negative 1 over a. <coughs> hyperbolic cosecant inverse, and this one gets an absolute value u over a plus c. So 
So I recommend these go on your cheat sheet, not in your memory. Lots of chances to make a mistake. And these are the only properties from the hyperbolic trig section you're going to need on your midterm. So I'm not going to, on your midterm or any quiz in the future, ask you about uh, what's a derivative of hyperbolic functions or inverse hyperbolic functions. You're only going to use these to figure out additional antiderivative forms. So these are the only um, the only derivatives, really the only formulas you need from this section. So everything else from 7.7 .7 you don't need on your cheat sheet. Now there's a chance I copied them out of my notes wrong. There's a chance you copied them off the board wrong. What's a good way to make sure these errors don't occur when they go into your cheat sheet? So I would recommend copying them straight out of the book onto your cheat sheet, as opposed to copying them off your notes, which were copied off of my notes, which were copied off of my other notes. So I think it's gone through four or five different copying over. So the book's a good choice to default to because the chance of an error in the book is lower than the chance of an error inside your notes. Unfortunately, the chance of an error is still not zero, but most of the formulas in boxes in your book are correct. So you can either get them in 7.7 seven or right after it in chapter 8. There's a box of, it's not a complete box, but it's nearly complete. On the back of the book, there's a large section as well. So there's three, yeah, three places to go. Um, I think this table is one of the last things in 7.7 seven now, this particular one. So we're going to do, no, I thought we were going to do an example. So I don't have any examples lined up, so I'm just going to direct you to the web work. These work just like the inverse trig derivative, uh, antiderivative forms. So you're going to look for uh, something just like we did in 7.6. So I'll go real quick into back to 7.6. And it was what we did at the end, basically. So that last problem we did, we turned it into du over a squared plus u squared. However, what if it was a squared minus u squared? Inverse tangent wouldn't work anymore. So in that case, you'd have to look at your uh, hyperbolic forms. So there's two extra, uh, five extra forms you have now. And we're going into integration by parts. That is 8.1. So chapter 8 is all techniques of integration. Right now you know exactly one technique of integration. What is a technique you know? I think I call it a tool sometimes. U sub. U -sub. You know lots of integral forms. So if it looks just like this form, you know what it turns into as an antiderivative. But you don't actually know many techniques. So if it looks like just the right form, you can integrate it. If it doesn't look like just the right form and you can't get it there with the u sub, then you basically can't uh, integrate it so far. So we're going to learn a lot more tricks. And first one is integration by parts. So here's where I tell you table 8.1 is a summary of most integrals that you need. Now, if you're wondering which ones are missing, I haven't looked super closely at it, but that would be a good question on the forums in Chapter 8. What's missing? 
between your notes and what's on table 8-1. So what integral forms are not in that table? There's probably only two or three in there. So we're going to start out by applying the product rule and then doing some odd things. So what's the derivative of f times g? Yep, so we got f prime g plus f g prime. So that's just product rule right there, nothing special going on. What we are going to do now is integrate both sides. So remember, you're basically doing math correct as long as you treat both sides the same. You can m basically do whatever operation you want as long as, you know, if you're going to take a square root, you better not have negative on one side unless you're ready to deal with complex numbers. But you can still square root negatives if you need to, but what we're going to do is integrate both sides of this equation right here. I'm going to be lazy and not write of x, of x, of x, of x the whole time. No, actually I am, because it will be important. I can't get away with being lazy. Because what we're about to do and I'm going to apply the integral to the sum of the two in one move. So the integral on the right side is the sum of the integral, the two integrals. What property, calculus property, can I use on the left side? So if I read this off, this says the antiderivative of the derivative of f of g, or of f times g. So if you take the antiderivative of the derivative, they're going to cancel out. So this is the f first fundamental theorem of calculus. Either order, they cancel out. Derivative of an integral cancels, and integral of a derivative cancels. called this FTOC part one, fundamental theorem of calculus first part. And we're going to do something strange, which is solve for the second integral. So I'm going to subtract the first integral to the left side. So this is going to be f g minus integral f prime g dx equals integral f x g prime x dx. And we're going to change the names of some, make some substitutions here. It looks like I'm going to do a u sub. So I'm going to let u equal f of x. So what does du equal? f prime of x, that's it? Or dx. dx. So u is f of x, which makes du f prime x dx. And we just call this part u right here. And I'm going, actually, let me use a different color. We'll go blue. So that's u. And somewhere, and there's a u over here. So 
Somewhere there's a DU hanging around. Where is the DU? It's a little tricky because it's not directly next to each other, but those two put together are DU right there. And the other substitution we're going to make, I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to let dw equal g prime x dx. Or we could just, so if that's dw, what does w equal? g of x. So if w is g of x, dw is g prime x dx. Now we're going to make all the substitutions in green. I will write down where W goes. Uh oh, I meant to use the letter B. Sorry about that. So they should be V and DV. All right, so on the green marker, we're going to write where V is going to go. And I'll use squiggles for that. We got V right there. V and over here, DV. Hey, Seahawks colors. So let's write this in terms of U's and V's only. UV minus integral V DU equals integral U DV. This is integration by parts right here. The form we're going to use, I'm just going to move the integral. I'm going to reverse the order of the equation. UDV equals UV minus integral V DU. This is a good moment to make sure your U's don't look like your V's. So you may ha write a V that has uh, a rounded, uh, doesn't have a point at the bottom like mine. If you're going to write your V like that, you can't really write your U like this because they're both sort of rounded. So if you write your V like that, the way I do it is I write U with a tail or a foot or whatever they call it. And if your V's are sharp, I can't even really write that well, but. There we go. If you have a sharp absolute value style V, then you can write your U like that. So just be aware, you're, make sure your V is on like your U's. You may not have thought about it because when you're writing English, you know what word you're writing generally. So it's obvious which one of the two you're, you're using. But if you look at UV, you need to know which one is U, which one is V. So who cares? Why are we doing this? We're going to go ahead and solve some problems that we couldn't solve before. So first up, we'll do one that will seem very straightforward. Now, what you're going to do, <coughs> you're beginning with the left side. So you're starting here. And what you do is you decide on, you're really making one choice. You're letting u equal something, which also means dv equal, so u equals something, dv is the rest. So whatever you didn't choose for u is going into dv. So there are two, on this first problem, there's two choices for u. Well, there's two general choices. I either go with u equals x or u equals cosine x. And whichever one I choose, if I go u is x, that means everything else is dv. If I make the other choice, if I make cos x u, then dv is what's left over, which is the x and the dx. So whatever I choose for u, dv is everything I didn't choose.
So let u equal x. And what is left over, so our leftovers are dv. What is left over? So forget about x. What's left over? Cos x dx. Don't forget the dx part. All right, so u is x, dv is cos x dx. So we have to figure out what is du and what is a regular v. So we have to now find the other ones. So now we find du and v. So if u is x, what is du? dx. Now when I say find, you're not choosing. You're not making a choice. You've already made your choice. You're just computing now. So there's not, it's not an option as to what would I like to make du. You chose u, du is set. So we chose v, uh, dv. So what is regular v? Take a guess and write sine x. How do I check? This derivative of sine x is regular cosine x, so this works out. So if that's v, then we got the right dv. And now we're going to make all these substitutions into here. So we started with, if I rewrite it in u's and v's, we started with u dv, the left side. And I'm going to rewrite the right side, which is uv minus integral v du. So I just rewrote the integration by parts. And now we're going to take the four pieces and drop them in where they go. So uv is x sine x minus integral v, which is sine x du, which is dx. Any questions on substituting back in? So why do we have a much better integral than we had at the beginning? Still have a dx. We still have a dx, and we still have a trig function, but what do we not have anymore? The extra x. We don't have an extra x. So we got rid of that x. So now we can take the antiderivative. So write the antiderivative down. And you can do guess and check. And I guessed wrong, so I'll go with positive cos x. Remember, your, at some point you get a plus c. I recommend writing your plus c when you've done your last antiderivative. So you do get a plus c. And I like to think about it. It's hiding inside the last antiderivative you do. So when you finally do your last antiderivative, there's going to be a plus c that's going to appear. How do I know if this is right or wrong? Maybe I just made all this stuff up. Take the derivative. What do I have to do? And when I take the derivative, what specifically, what rule do I have to follow? I don't quite need the chain rule. There's no powers. There's less rules on the list to guess from, though. Product rule. So let's derive of x sine x. It'll be sine x times x cos x minus sine x. So that, that signs will cancel, and you'll have x cos x. So you should check by taking your derivative. Make sure that it works out. So let's talk about bad choices. I'm not going to use a red marker because they're not wrong. They're just bad. So let's go. We'll pick a new color. Purple works. So I'm going to make the opposite choice this time. So I'm going to choose cos x for u, and dv is the leftovers, x dx. So if u is cos x, what is du? Negative sine x, and what is a regular v? Uh, 
x squared, and then another 1 half. So we're going to make all these subs. So this is integral of u dv equals uv minus integral v du. And uv 1 half x squared cos x minus integral v 1 half x squared du. Somewhere sine x, there should be a dx attached to it too. So we can clean this up a tiny bit. x squared cos x plus 1 half integral x squared sine x dx. So everything we did is correct, but why is it not good? Why are we in a worse place than where we started? Because we still have the x squared. So the first part's fine. No problem right there. What about this right here? So it's trig function times higher power of x. So we were going the wrong direction. The other way lowered the power of x. This way raised the power of x. So you want to, in this case, lower the power of x. So this is where, so this got more complicated. So bad. Not wrong. You technically you could do integration by parts twice the right the correct way and get to the answer and all the extra junk will cancel out, which might be a fun thing to try. But if you're crunch for time, this is bad. You want to start over and make a different choice for you. So this is what I call the spidey sense. If things are worse than when they start when you started, it's usually you're going the wrong way. We'll see one problem, maybe two that. It actually doesn't matter what you choose. It doesn't get better either way. But you can still power through. But generally, most of the problems I give you, you're going to make sure that it gets easier.